see me a little bit. Hope everyone is doing well out there. Um, so as Steve said, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about ESAM capabilities today. Um, and before I get started, I wanna just mention there's other resources available with CMAS. So um, if you're here today, you're obviously watching um, the Beyond the Scope series that we're putting on weekly. So you'll be able to just kind of get an idea of resources available and what other instrumentation there is, some different techniques and stuff from that. Um, but also, you can also schedule one-on-one -on -one consultations with any of the instrument managers. There's information on the website about that. If you have questions about any of it, feel free to contact us. Um, experimental design and that kind of stuff. We love to chat about it. Um, or if you have any questions about remote being in or trying to get any of software to do your analysis, just go ahead and email us as well. So um, just an overview of CMAS again, if you haven't been out there before. Um, we're primarily an electron microscopy facility. Um, if you look on the left-hand side there, it's going to be mainly our transmission electron microscopes. We have um, quite a suite in the building, so ranging from um, our Techni instruments for a lot of initial work, going up to the Titans and our brand new Themis for um, really high-end microscopy work, going down to atomic resolution and doing some really cool work there, um, along with our cryo capabilities, which are fairly new, which Josh will be talking about a bit next week with our Glacios and Krios. We also have a couple dual beam instruments for sample prep, imaging, um, and looking at things, again, serial sectioning, that kind of stuff. Um, and for our scan electron microscopes, we have currently four microscopes. So from our higher resolution APRIO instruments, where Steve's mainly in charge of those, they're kind of the workhorse high resolution instruments where we get a lot of work done. The Quant SEM, where we can do some initial imaging, some lower res stuff, it's a great workhorse instrument there. And then the instrument that I'll be talking a bit about more today, the Quattro Environmental SEM. It's our newest SEM. It has a huge suite of instrumentation available on it. And additionally, with those, we have our HeliScan, which Carly talked about last week, XRD, and other techniques. Um, before I get started on my actual talk, I just wanted to give you a quick background on me so you get to know me a little bit better. Um, I did my undergraduate work at New Mexico Tech, um, where I kind of more focused on actually organic synthesis. Um, I worked in an organic synthesis lab, loved it there. Was originally going to do that kind of stuff going to grad school, but my plans kind of changed when I went to Penn State for my graduate degree. Um, I fell in love with working on instrumentation, building um, instrumentations, that kind of stuff. So I started looking at optical properties of aerosol particles, doing some reactions in there as well. And that's where I started my microscopy work. Um, after I finished my PhD, I was at the Materials Characterization Lab at Penn State for a year where I managed a couple of the microscopes, so similar facility to what we have at CMAS. Um, and then I moved on to try and um, do some more research again. Um, I did my postdoctoral work at Environmental and Molecular Sciences Laboratory at Pacific Northwest National Lab, where I kind of mixed everything together that I'd done before my research of atmospheric aerosol particles and a lot of in situ microscopy, which that led me back to here. I love working with a lot of different users and being able to do some in situ work is a lot of fun. So besides my educational background, um, you wanna to get to know me a little bit. Uh, I like to spend as much time as I can outdoors. So either I'll be hiking, disc golfing, doing whatever I can outdoors, but Often, as is the case now, I'm stuck inside a lot, so I'll tend to do some woodworking. So I was in Washington, I started building wine barrel furniture, or currently now, probably to my wife's dismay a little bit, I decided to start remodeling our house a bit, and that's what our shower currently looks like in the bottom right-hand corner. So hopefully that'll be done fairly soon with the time I have available. Uh, so with my talk today, I really want to talk about in situ microscopy, but I want to start off comparing it to kind of traditional microscopy. So traditional microscopy 
is a really great way to look at things um, either before or after and experiments have gone on with them. So you can get really high resolution in the microscopes themselves. You have very clean environments. So you don't have to worry about any kind of beam damage, anything like that um, on your samples. Uh, contamination um, and often there's more ways to image your samples with lower geometric constraints because the SEM chamber is going to be large and you don't have to try and jam in some extra instrumentation in there to do your analysis. But as I mentioned before, you're only going to be looking at what the experiment looks like before or after you do something to it. So if you're trying to look at something in series, you'll have to do multiple experiments, stopping them and looking at each one of those individual points. So then you can introduce a lot of artifacts from doing this. And you don't know if you're looking at something that's actually going on in situ. Um, and additionally, most of those experiments are gonna be done under high vacuum. So you have to have a sample that's gonna be high vacuum compatible. So that's kind of where in situ microscopy comes in. Um, you can look at samples in their native environment, um, be it, oh, I don't update. Um, be it um, like an aqueous environment where you're trying to keep it hydrated or under a kind of more low back environment. Um, you can do dynamic experiments. So you record your experiment the entire time, giving you that continuous record. Um, so I basically think of these kind of microscopes as more of a laboratory inside chamber. But again, I like to mention, hey, there's a lot of things you have to think about when you're doing these experiments. So either physical geometric limitations of what your sample can actually be. Again, you'll end up with some artifacts because you're looking at a substrate surface generally. Um, and these experiments do take a lot of time. So just think of the full experimental process, trying to figure out how to run an experiment inside of a vacuum chamber. And for us, um, equipment wear, um, it gets to be a little bit more wear on the instruments themselves. So there's a couple different kinds of in situ experimental conditions you can run in general. So the major one would be a controlled atmosphere. Um, so like what I'll be talking about later is looking at kind of wet samples, it's either water uptake, um, while changing humidity, keeping things hydrated. And you can include almost any kind of gas into the ESEM. Um, I haven't done a whole huge range of gases, but I've also looked at a lot that are gonna be in low vacuum with an inert gas environment. So it's really nice to be able to do that, um, or if your samples are outgassing or anything. Um, it's fairly straightforward to control the temperature, um, either raising the temperature of the heating stage, um, cooling it down cooling stage, or even having a combination of both where you can hit that temperature range that you wanna see for any kind of phase transformations or whatever else could be happening with your samples. Um, I'm gonna include mechanical testing. So if your samples are interested in deform, what's going on during the deformation process, um, you can do that. Um, and then also other external stimuli. Um, there's lots of feed-throughs for it. There's lots of other add-ons for any of these instruments. So if you're ever interested in doing something we don't have, definitely talk to us and we can discuss trying to figure out a way to do those experiments. So the main instrument that I'm going to focus on today is going to be our Quattro Environmental SEM. It has a lot of capabilities. So this image is kind of the above view of it, showing that basically every single port on this instrument is taken up. Um, so it it's, has a lot going on with it, which means we can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Um, so for the in-situ capabilities, we have heating, cooling, cryo. Um, ESEM capabilities, we can do load cells, electrical feed throughs, and then also be able to do these with different analytical techniques. So you can definitely do some imaging um, in your sample there. So you look at secondaries, backscatters, or if you have a thin sample, we have a stem detector in there, fast beam blanker for any time dependent experiments. Um, we have an really nice new equipment from EDEX for EDS and EBSD, along with the Hariba full spectrum cathodoluminescence system. So what I wanna mainly go over in this talk is gonna be some use cases and a little bit of background on each experimental 
design. So I'm gonna start off talking about the cooling stages. So the first sample we'll look at is a hydrogel sample um, and then a dynamic experiment looking at some particles. Um, then we'll show an ex uh, experiment that we did with the heating stage, um, looking at transformation that's occurring as soon as we heat the sample. And then also I have a few tensile experiments that we ran that were really cool that we got some really nice results from. So uh, the first stage that I'm gonna talk about is the cooling stage. So in this top right hand corner, um, you can see what the wet stem holder looks like. So in this case, there's still a hydrogel sample on the surface after we took it out. Um, sample constraints are gonna be about a millimeter diameter on that. Um, you can also take out that stub and put in a general TEM size sample on a grid to look at it in STEM mode or even just use that as a really nice flat background. Um, additionally, with that, you can start to see phase transitions that are at lower temperatures. Um, the Peltier coolers can go down to around minus 20 degrees. Um, we also have a cryo stage on here, so we can go down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. And so you can even look at frozen samples. And then, um, again, one reason to also cool your sample besides even try and do some in situ experiments is to reduce the beam damage on your sample. Um, so generally, if you're cooler, you're not going to have as much knock on damage to your sample itself. And then if you incorporate this sample along with um, low vacuum, then you can keep your samples wet. So generally, um, on the phase diagram, we'll lower the temperature to be somewhere around between probably two and five degrees C. So then the water vapor content only need to be around seven to 900 pascals. So you can kind of keep at least a decent resolution in there in the microscope. So I also like to always talk a little bit about the signal generation in LOVAC. Well, I mentioned it, it's gonna be a bit different than what's going on in a general SEM. So most people think of charge mitigation with low vacuum. Um, it's a great thing to have in there. If you start rastering your beam across the sample, it'll start to charge up negatively if it's not conductive. <laughs> and if you have a conductive gas in there, then you can help mitigate the charge. What's interesting is we actually are more detecting the ionization of the gas itself um, from this. So from the diagram here on the right, you see your electron beams coming through. It's gonna be interacting with water molecules the entire way down. So basically, if you increase your path length, the more gas is in there, the more scatter you get, the more, the lower your resolution will be. But then interestingly, as soon as you get an electron emission from it, those secondary electrons will interact with the gas as well and cause a cascade reaction. So you'll actually start to increase your signal with increased gas path length. So when we're running these experiments, we have to look at a lot more variables than um, general imaging as far as trying to get really good resolution, um, get good signal, eliminate beam damage, and any of that kind of stuff. So it's it's a little bit more work, but it's really cool being able to do all that kind of stuff. So the first sample that I want to talk about is going to be imaging of a hydrogel sample while it's fully hydrated. Um, these samples we got from Ali from the Hutzel Research Lab and Mechanical Engineering. Um, they've done quite a bit of research looking at these already um, using the micro CT to look at the full structure of them. And also we had looked at the samples um, actually fixed and then looked at under high vacuum. So I was interested to see, hey, how are these gonna interact um, when they stay fully hydrated? Are they gonna look very similar? Um, so with these hydrogels, they're gonna be gelatin-based hydrogels um, used for tissue engineering. And as soon as you start to dry them out at all, the structure does change quite a bit. So you wanna make sure you can keep them hydrated. Um, down here, the bottom right, you can see I cut the hydrogel into a few pieces, and that piece right in the center is the one that we imaged in the SEM. Um, after we're done imaging, I left it in there for an extra hour or so. So it's in there for a total of two hours, pulled it out, it's still in a puddle of water. So it's really cool being able to 
um, see the experiment where your sample is still fully hydrated, we're able to do some imaging. It wasn't really dried out at all. Um, so for actual imaging of these samples, we were able to get fairly high resolution with them. So I could observe um, features down to about 50 nanometers in size. So with the FAG system, we're able to still get very high resolution even in low vac mode, where with this one, we're operating at um, one and a half degrees Celsius and almost 700 pascals. And then we can incorporate that, um, use some large area mapping, use some of our mapping software and be able to look at larger areas as well. Mm -hmm. uh, second experiment that I wanna talk about <clears throat> is a little bit closer to what I've done previously in my research. I got this sample from actually my old advisor at Penn State. Um, it's one of the projects I've just been working on on the side. Um, it's looking at ammonium sulfate dicarboxylic acids, mixtures of particles, and it's kind of relevance for atmospheric properties. So if you have a particle in the atmosphere, it's going to undergo lots of different phase transformations. So what humidities are these happening at is kind of the question. Um, so if we look at this diagram on the top right, um, you can see these particles are fully deliquesced. Um, they're wet, they're droplets, it's nice. So as you slowly decrease the humidity, um, we observed that the particles actually started to effloresce at different times based on their size. So basically the larger particles would effloresce at um, higher humidities and the smaller particles would effloresce at lower humidities. Uh, it's a nice observation that we've been observing. So then the other cool thing is during this entire time we're taking a video. So I'm gonna play this video. And what you can see is there's gonna be, as we increase the humidity, the particles uptake water. Um, and then you can see it fully deliquesces, grows a little bit more. And then I move to a different part of it and then start lowering the humidity. And we're at about 60%. Let's keep decreasing humidity. And then as soon as we get around 35%, you'll see it quickly starting to um, effloresce. And all these videos are gonna be sped up um, quite a bit so that um, it only happens about 30 seconds, whereas experience themselves will take probably a few hours to actually run. Okay, so now we talked about the cooling stage. I wanna talk a little bit about the high vacuum heating stage. Um, so we're able to cool it down with the other stages down to about minus 20 or liquid nitrogen temperatures. Um, we can also raise up the temperature up to 1100 degrees using the high vacuum heating stage. Kind of sample constraints here are going to be um, about a centimeter square, so it fits on that silicon wafer. Um, and all these experiments are being done under high vacuum, unless you're at very low, like around 100 or so, then we can use low vacuum. Um, and they have nice analytical um, compatibility as well. So you can do EDS maybe up to 400, maybe 500 degrees. And that's mainly because it's still a furnace type holder. So if you look in the top right here, that's what the sample stage looks like under vacuum at 600 degrees. You can see the center of it, it's a nice um, silicon wafer, but then around it, that heating holder is emitting a lot of radiation in front, which will swamp out any of your EDS signal. And then as soon as you start to go up to higher temperatures, higher than 600, we need to start using a furnace for it, so you put cover on it, and then we can go up to 1100, or if we use a different one, we go up to 900 for EBSD. So the sample I want to talk about for this was heating of a nickel titanium shape memory alloy. Um, so this sample is courtesy of Ben Sun and the Ramirez group in welding engineering. And it is a really cool example where the experiment worked the first time. So it's actually really cool seeing it work very well. Um, and what we saw with this sample is initially, um, it's a nice polished sample as you can see here. Room temperature, 100 degrees, 200, there's not much change. And then if you just view it statically at 300 degrees, you say, oh, hey, there's some kind of phase transformation that's happening. So it's changing from 
that martensitic phase to the austenite phase, somewhere between those two. In order to nail that down, you'd have to do a lot of ex situ experiments, but in situ you could do this at a single time. So I'm gonna play this video. This video we're starting at a temperature of about 200 degrees, just to chop off that lower portion where nothing happened, and go to 300 degrees. So you're increasing the temperature. you start to see that phase transformation happening along the different grain boundaries. And then from this, you can start to understand not only the before and after, but also the, what's happening during it. If there's something interesting happening with certain grains or anything like that. And then again, you could couple this heating with EBSD to characterize it even further. And it even works a little bit nicer since you're burning off any contaminants on the surface. So the last thing I kind of want to talk about, we have a few examples, is the mechanical testing stage. And so with the mechanical testing stage, what we have, it's a camera with the Weiss tensile compression module. So it looks like up here in the top right. Um, you can control a lot of different parameters in there. You can look to very small samples or up to larger samples. So we have two load cells to deal with that. We have our large load cell that can go up to five kilonewtons. So if you're looking at metals and that kind of stuff, it's um, can able to handle that. Um, also, we can go down to load force load forces with the one newton load cell with basically micronewton sensitivity, and it's really nice for kind of more biological type samples. Um, and then it's also going to be compatible with heating um, and EBSD. And if you look in the lower right, this is kind of the image I like to show any of our service engineers just to freak them out a little bit. Um, it's just that camera view directly from the back. So you can see the edge on view of the um, sample stage itself right there and the SEM column and EBSD camera are both inserted into some cavities that are basically within that. So if you open the door or anything, um, things would definitely get broken. So it's, it's a nice tight fit in there and it's kind of a cool thing to see. So the first sample I want to talk about with this is from Ben Jordan in the Fraser Research Group. And he was interested in understanding what was happening with this nickel super alloy um, at room temperature, raised temperatures. So I'll show two parts of this experiment. Um, so if you look at this top right hand, it's the before image where we can get nice grain contrast. So you can start to see what these grains actually are, where they are. And then also, uh, if you get any precipitates forming along the grain boundaries, you can see those. Um, then you can go run the experiment. Again, we're doing this at fairly high resolution. Um, so you can see these grains. And then after the experiment, you can um, go back, play the video, see where any kind of um, slip or anything's happening along your sample. So it's really cool we were able to see that and what grains were changing in situ. Um, but you have to kind of worry about two different phases. You can, if you get super lucky, you could do two experiments in one where you look at high resolution and then low resolution um, to see crack propagation but it's generally better to do kind of two different experiments to make sure you get two really nice data sets. So that's what I'm gonna show with this video here. Um, initially, you can see where this cracks start to form. And I'm gonna play the video. Um, as we apply more strain, you'll be able to see the crack propagation along the top and bottom of this failure point. So you see it's starting to crack both sides. You can kind of follow along what's going on with the grains. And then it's nice we're able to just zoom in on what's exactly happening down there. So you get this nice continuous images of all of these until you hit that complete failure point. Um, so then in addition to being able to do that, um, it's a sample that I got from Zach, again, the Fraser Research Group, where we had done some strain mapping of a titanium alloy. And I just saw in the last image, last slide, we were able to see what deformation was happening 
here. So you see before and after deformation, it gives you some information about what's going on with the grains. But uh, if you're interested in getting some more quantitative data about that, we're able to do that with EBSD. And it's really cool. We have the new uh, Velocity EBSD camera from EDEX. So if you get everything optimized very nicely, um, you can go up to about 4,500 index points per second. Um, with this kind of setup, we're going to be a bit slower, but still it's going to be a very, very fast camera. So you can actually do multiple EBSD scans during your experiments. But with the EBSD, you're able to see um, the grain orientation change. So if you have any rotation of your sample there, and then also you can do some um, grain reference orientation mapping so you can understand where your actual strain is. So you can see with these two images on the right, um, before there wasn't too much strain in the sample and then after you end up with a lot of localized strain at a couple different points, which you can analyze later on. Um, the last example of this that I wanted to show is kind of highlighting our low force cell. Um, we're looking around this, I was doing this with actually the Thermo Fisher um, engineers to kind of test out some different parameters that we we're doing. And it's of a light like, dew free wipe, so just a wipe you have around the lab. I wanted to be able to see what sensitivity we had along with also um, what's actually happening on a scientific basis. So um, I captured a couple still images here on the right. Um, so the still image is from here, you'll see it during it. And this inset, it's a little difficult to see. If you see that vertical line there, that's the point at which the experiment's at. So we ended up going to, um, in the milli Newton range was our initial failure. And then this was right after a fairly large failure of this point right here. So we correlate that together nicely. And then this was actually that very bottom failure. So if you look right down there, you can actually understand the failure of just a few uh, fibers in a uh, wipe like this. So um, I'm gonna play this video. It's gonna first look like it's zooming in. That's because we're pulling some tension on it. And then we'll start to see some of the failures happening. And we, we cut it so that we'd be able to know right where the failures were gonna occur. So. It's actually really nice you're able to see kind of the different failure mechanisms of either the fibers actually breaking or just sliding past each other in this video. So here we go. This will be that kind of final area where the final, um, oh, there's gonna be, so and then there we go, final breaking point. So it's really cool we were able to see what was going on at fairly high resolution and at really low loads. Um, so I mentioned all those techniques that we can do in situ on the microscope. Um, we can also use a lot of in situ, uh, analytical capabilities with these in situ experiments. So I mentioned before, we have energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, so you can do elemental composition, elemental mapping. So I said mineral grain that I had here for our EDS. Um, EBSD, it's compatible with basically everything as well. Um, so you can get a lot of crystal orientation info, like I mentioned with the titanium alloy. And what I haven't talked about much is our cathodoluminescence imaging and spectroscopy system. You get a lot of really cool information about band gap chemical bonding, so any kind of that low energy phenomenon. So we can look at stuff anywhere between 200 to 2200 nanometers. So in this case, this is a zinc sulfide mineral where you start to see some zoning in there. So backscatter, EDS didn't show much, be able to actually do spectroscopy on there and see what the differences are there. But that's uh, for another webinar, hopefully. And then uh, so you can couple all these with electron signal detection. So secondary electrons for topography, backscattered electrons for some elemental contrast. If your sample is nice and thin, we have a stem detector in there. And also uh, we've been playing around with um, electron beam induced current experiments in there, um, kind of collaborating with Tyler Grassman and his group 
on those to get that up and running. So it's fun to be able to put in some extra things to do the electrical feed throughs to understand what's going on. Um, and then in addition to um, SEM in situ capabilities, there's other in situ capabilities available at CMAS. So depending on the range of sizes you wanna go to. Um, I put TM on here since we have uh, quite a few of heating and cooling stages on there. Again, TM, it's nice, you get high resolution, but you'll end up with a lot more stringent requirements to be able to do these experiments. Um, but we have a nice MEMS heating holder um, that's part of the Jorg Inchex group um, at CMAS, along with some furnace and cryo holders as well. Uh, the FIB um, has a cryo stage as well for some um, experiments in situ, and then also the micro CT um, that Carly runs. Um, it doesn't necessarily have any right now, but all the experiments are run under ambient pressure since we're using x-rays, which is really nice. It also is a very large chamber, so you're able to accommodate custom-built enclosures quite a bit. And I know we're playing around with a couple ideas, so there's always new capabilities along the pipeline. If you have other ideas as well, definitely contact us and let us know. Uh, I mentioned before, uh, Steve did um, the other upcoming seminars. So um, if you're interested in any of these, definitely they're gonna be very interesting. I know next week, Yoshi's gonna be giving a talk on cryo-electron microscopy with a couple examples from the current coronavirus. Um, and then also Steve will be looking at CMEDS, followed by Nicole, look at microelectron diffraction. And also, if you connect with us, that'd be great. Um, we have a lot of resources available, so either any of those are available as well.